morning, everyone. Welcome to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. This is Andrew Murata, and this is show number 16. Good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Gavin, that was a sing-along song, too. I know you I know you had me on mute, so I couldn't sing along. What was the name of that song, Gavin? I'm Into Something Good by Herman's Hermits. Her- See, I was thinking it was The Monkees, similar to The Monkees. Close. Herman's Hermits. Was that a one-hit wonder, Gavin? No, they had a number of hits. Oh. Um, very big in the 1960s. Were you a fan of that song? I, that wasn't my favorite by them. I liked it. I had other favorites by them because I grew up with the oldies in the 1990s, so they played that a lot back then. Now, unfortunately, that's, um, you know, time passes on and um, radio changes. That doesn't get played as much as 25 years ago. Well, I was glad to hear it today. That is a song chosen by our guest who's going to be up in the next segment, Michelle DiFilippo. Michelle is the owner and... Uh, um, founder of Design 1106, and Michelle has been a super duper help in me on this journey uh, of me writing my book. And if you've been following along with the show, I uh, was very happy to, to release The Principle Surviving and Thriving 125 Points of Wisdom, Practical Tips, and Relatable Stories for All School Principles. We released that last weekend. At the Milford Readers and Writers Festival, we had a fantastic uh, time. I met some great people. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Evel Ortiz and his wife, uh, Ann and Jimmy Starace. I met them uh, at the weekend. They came up. They're fans of the show. So, so happy uh, that they are listening to Education, Leadership, and Beyond. And I was able to meet them and uh, sign their book for them. So that was great. We are on the following frequencies and radio stations. Country 107.7 WDLC, 106.9 WYNY, and Wall Radio on the following FM frequencies, 94.1, 94.9, 105.7, 106.1 on the FM, and 13.40 AM, and 101.5 HD2. So, uh, again, super duper happy to be back. This is show 16 and, uh, hey, we got that book going, and I hope we're getting into something good with the book. Um, I will be at the uh, Fall Foliage Festival in Port Jervis, New York, this Sunday. That would be September 24th, and uh, we're hoping for good weather and, and a great crowd uh, with the Port Jervis community uh, coming out for the Fall Foliage Festival. So that'll be tomorrow pretty much all day. Well, let's get started with this week's show. And again, uh, the the music selections and uh, the content is related to my my guest who's going to be up in the next segment, Michelle DiFilippo. And uh, again, she's been a great help for me in getting this book from that Word document I submitted to her uh, a while back to uh, producing a super duper book. We had great feedback last weekend and we're hoping for great things. Like the song said, we hope we're into something good. So... My concept uh, this week to start the show is creativity and ideas. Where do they come from? How do uh, inventors, how do artists, how do authors get their ideas? Do they have uh, meetings uh, with with others? Do they have a meeting where they're going to sit down and, and do they just press their temples together and say, I need an idea? You know, do they go walking out in the woods and, and get a flash of inspiration from the sky? You know, what what happens and, and how do people gain their ideas and develop their, their, their creativity? For me personally, I am a meeting guy. If you've read the book, if you've listened to the show, I schedule different things. I'm in the studio today with my man Gavin Burt. We scheduled this time and, and we had this time to do it. I was at meetings all day. Uh, with school, and I got another meeting tonight, and those times are, are broken down. I don't schedule 30 minutes to say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have uh, some ideas here and just have them come to me like that. Um, but in, in research and in listening to podcasts and reading books, I did read a book uh, this summer. I've mentioned it on the show, Teach Like a Pirate by Dave Burgess. And on page 40, Dave talks about the six words – And I'm going to read an excerpt uh, from that. And again, if you've listened to the show, we had uh, uh, Becky Fedorik on where we talked about Teach Like a Pirate. 
And Dave was uh, talking to somebody after a presentation, and the woman said to him, well, it's easy for you. You're creative. And Dave writes here, wow, let me repeat that. It's easy for you. You're creative. The first sinister implication can be found in the first four words. It's easy for you. Dave goes on to write, really? So with those four words, she dismissed 16 years of hard work, 16 years of brainstorming, 16 years worth of notebook after notebook filled with ideas, most of, most of which were not very good. 16 years of failures and lessons that blew up in my face. 16 years of fine tuning and making adjustments because what I thought were great ideas went completely wrong. 16 years and he goes on and on and on. He writes, I worked my butt off to build a class that is outrageously engaging, fun, educationally sound, and dearly loved by students. So Dave really writes, it's not easy. He works at it. It is something that is very challenging for him, but it's important, so he does it. And and that got me thinking about, you know what? It, it, it isn't it isn't easy. And and how do people do that? You know, this this book I wrote and this radio show, where do I come up with my guests? You know, we're gonna dive into that in a minute. But you have to work at it. This has to be something that you open your mind to. So I want to move on to that um, that point. If you're tuned into something, whatever it is with your family, with your business, whatever it is you are, tune into it, focus on it, and open your mind. I talked this summer. Uh, we went on an RV trip. I had never driven an RV. I had never been out west with my family. And the more we researched, the more we got going with it, the more I focused on it, it was amazing how I started to see RVs on the road. And I started to notice different campsites and different things about uh, driving cross country and all that kind of stuff. I had never even, it was like I never even saw the RVs on the road. But my mind became open to it because I was focused in on it. So I want to offer you a couple of tips of things that worked for me, things that, that got me going in terms of writing this book and coming up with ideas for the show, coming up with uh, uh, different things that have helped me along the way. So if you want to jot them down, Evel, if you're sitting with your coffee on Saturday morning, you want to jot these down, let's start with, again, and the, and the point we're talking about is coming up with ideas for things where your creative spirit number one brainstorm sit down you you want to do something let's say i was going to offer you five thousand dollars if you showed me a sheet of brainstorming ideas of a new product that you wanted to develop and you, you know i'm not going to give you any rules or anything like that any idea that you could do about a product you want to develop. And I said, I'm going to give you $5,000. You would come up with ideas. So you get that paper. It's like a blank canvas. I like to have a little quiet background music going, a uh, little light country maybe, um, and, and no hurdles, nothing that w what can go wrong with the idea, nothing why you can't do it, just ideas and, and, and do that. That's something that I like to do just on a scratch piece of paper. And I just get going with different things. I want to jot down. I like to doodle pictures, whether it's a circle, who knows? So that's one thing. The next thing I like is exercising. I like to either walk, ride a bike, go on a treadmill. When I'm on a treadmill, I keep a pad next to me. And whether I'm listening to a podcast, watching a YouTube, a TED Talk video, whatever it is, I'm jotting down ideas, things I've heard. And the exercising, it opens my mind. The endorphins get going. My blood gets going. The oxygen gets going. It's creating energy in my body, and, and it'll, it helps me. So I've gotten some tips, especially from my man, Mr. Lazaro, the uh, AP at Port Jervis Middle School. He says you shouldn't wear those uh, headphones when you're biking, but I do like the podcast um, because it gives me a lot of information and different things I'm, I'm hearing out there, a lot of ideas. So um, that's another thing. So brainstorming sessions, exercising. And the third is, as I just mentioned, listen to something or watch something on the topic that you're interested in. 
Maybe you're trying to develop something at your job. Uh, you want to start something new with your family. Maybe you're going to do a, uh, an RV uh, a trip. Well, punch in on podcasts, RVing. Go on Twitter, RVing. There's a ton of information out there. You know, meet people on Facebook. Put it out there on Facebook uh, in terms of, how you know, tell me about RVing. It, it's unbelievable. So get connected to the social media world. Again, I use the example of not to tell them what you had for lunch, but to get information. Step number four of things you could do with your creativity and ideas. Talk to somebody who's done it before you and done it well. I'm going to introduce you to Michelle DiFilippo in the next segment. She uh, writes in her her uh, advertising for her company. They give extra hold hand, uh, hand holding, and man, she sure held my hand through this process, and it was fantastic. So talk to someone who's done it. Uh, it was great. After this past weekend in in Milford, I got an email from someone who wrote a book, and they want some help to just like I said, how do I get it from the Word document to a physical book? How do I do that? And uh, I actually gave them Michelle's information. Uh, lastly, create the mindset of not yet. You haven't done it yet. You're not there yet. And, and if you have that mindset of instead of saying I can't do it or I'm afraid I've never done that before or I'm not sure how it's going to go, I just have, I'm not there yet. I haven't achieved it yet and you start working your way towards it. It's amazing what that little word yet will uh, do for you. So that's my concept for today in terms of creativity and ideas. And we're going to talk to someone that's super creative uh, coming up. Gavin, I see you getting the knob. Give me one more minute before we get going with that song. Um, Brainstorming. Exercise. It opens your mind. Listen to podcasts or get on social media for ideas. Talk to someone who's done it before you. Most, and I say most, successful people are willing to help those who might just be getting started because at some point they were just getting started too. And lastly, develop that mindset of not yet. This is Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. This is Andrew Murata, and we will be right back with Michelle Di Filippo. And welcome back to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, everyone. This is Andrew Murata, and this is show number 16. We are on Country 107.7 WDLC, 106.9 WYNY, and Wall Radio. And again, it's tough not to sing along to these great songs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break through one day. Gavin's going to let me sing. But that was another great tune selected by my friend, uh, and my guest coming up here, Michelle D. Filippo. Michelle, good morning and welcome to the show. Good morning, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me. This is a great opportunity and I hope to be very helpful to your listeners. Uh, I know you will, Michelle, because you've been very helpful to me. You're all the way out in Phoenix. I think you're the, the longest distance uh, guest we've had on so far on the show. I am, and, and, and we're celebrating this week because we're finally under 100 degrees for the high temperature each day. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, my paisan from Brooklyn, we'll get back to your Brooklyn days in a little bit, Michelle, but let's get right to it. You know, Michelle, you know my story and my listeners uh, that have been following along know the story that, that I wrote this book. I had this Word document and I shopped around uh, to, to find a company. I had no idea how I was going to get a book from a Word document and and we met you through a recommendation from my editor and uh you know we spoke on the phone well we reached out to you and you immediately got right back to us 
And again, I don't know you at that time. I didn't know you. And, and there was just an instant connection. Tell me, Michelle, about how do you connect with your customers when it's remote like that? You know, I can't see you. We're not shaking hands, your body language, but there was an instant connection. How did you develop that talent, uh, you know, across the phone or emails? Well, I, you, I don't know how to answer that exactly. I mean, I just try to, to be friendly to my potential customers, right? I, I want to help them. I, they, I know that they're feeling insecure. I know that they're entering a business for the first time, and they may not know very much about it. They're, they, they're inspired. They want to do it. But if you go online and you look for information, you can get overwhelmed very quickly. So I try to put myself in their shoes and just try to answer their questions and, and put them at ease and let them know that uh, we can be trusted and that we're on their side and we want a good book just as much as they want a good book. And you had the key word there, uh, Michelle, trusted, because as you've explained and as I've experienced and learned, there's a lot of stuff out there on the Internet. You don't know what you're getting. And uh, you developed pretty quickly uh, my trust and, and my assistant's trust uh, over the phone, and, and I don't take that for granted. Um, you also were very prompt. Uh, I had reached out to multiple companies. You were the first to get back to me, and again, your customer service was great. Um, you know, how, how do you handle all the initial you know, call, calls and emails you get for, for uh, potential customers? Well, I sit at my computer all day long, and when I see a message from a potential customer, that becomes the priority for me because um, a customer is the lifeblood of every business, right? It puzzles me when I'm a customer, when a business owner does not get back to me in, in a reasonable amount of time. And, and I really don't understand that. I know some designers personally who put uh, responding to prospective customers down at the bottom of the to-do list, it needs to be at the top because that's your next job. To me, that seems like common sense. You you would think, but you know, <laughs> they say common sense isn't all that common. Uh, <laughs> Michelle, that get, goes right into my next question. And, and again, our guest today is Michelle DiFilippo. Her company is called Design 1106. Uh, you could find her on the Internet, and she's all over social media. We'll get to that in a little bit, but you can meet her on LinkedIn and Twitter. And um, Again, her company is uh, Design 1106. Uh, Michelle, where did the name 1106 come from? Where, where is that? Well, actually, the name is 1106 Design, and I founded it uh, in 2001 when I uh, was forced to form a different company after I got divorced. Some of you may know what a community property state means. Uh, Arizona is a community property state. And so um, in our divorce, we had to split the existing company that I had, and, and I had to go off and find a new one. Well, by 2001, there were no domain names left for graphic design companies. Every single one of them was taken. Wow. So I went with my birthday, 1106. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. And here I'm calling it 1106. Forgive me, 1106. It's got a nice ring to it. And again, they could find you uh, online. You have a super website. Um, so, Michelle, I've learned over working with you for several months here, you know, you, you work from home. So this is a two-part question. Working from home and then working remotely, you have employees that are all over the country. How do you manage that? That's a, that's a totally different realm uh, that is foreign to me. I'm in a school building. I see my, my teachers every day, my, my staff. I'm in the classroom. I'm getting the, the vibe of the building and the, and the feel of the building because I could see them, touch it. You know, I know if there's garbage on the floor. You know, you're working with people all over the country. So it's, let's start with that. How do you how do you work remotely with people and, and do it effectively? Well, it, it's really quite easy today. But technology has made it possible for us to work together without actually sitting in the same location, at least as far as graphics go. I don't know that you could manage a school that way. Um, but our job, we communicate with each other through email, through phone calls. Um, back in the day, I owned a typesetting business that uh, required 3,000 square feet of office space and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. Today, we can do everything we did back then and more from a home office. So it's entirely due to the Internet and technology that, that we can work in this way. 
I have a project manager and 16 team members, and each of us works in our area of greatest strength uh, from home, probably in flip-flops. So there's really no office politics, no distractions. We think it's great. That's tremendous that you've been able to build that that team. Now, are they independent contractors, Michelle? How does that work? Um, sometimes yes and sometimes no. It just depends on what they do for me and how much of it they do. Okay. Michelle, when I'm home, you know, I, I, I'm obviously not at school, um, and, and I get my to-do list from my wife or I make a, a, a to-do list, but when I'm home, my, my you know, my my mind isn't, isn't as focused as it is when I'm uh, either refereeing or I'm at school. I'm kind of I'm kind of relaxed in a way. Uh, how do you have the mindset of well I'm working, but but you're home. Like do you go into a separate room and like put on your super duper design book costume? Like how do you how do you get <laughs> in the mindset of I'm working if you just came out of your you know, your kitchen? Well, it, it it does require some discipline, but but the discipline comes from the work. Uh, I do have a separate office that I work out of, um, but I sometimes I don't get out of the office because there's so many things to do that I just have to stay here and do it. Um, I don't allow myself to get too distracted, um, and, and I have to say I don't have young children at home anymore, so that's a big help. When my son was a teenager and he was home and he was in and out all day, it was a little more difficult to stay focused, but uh, now I live alone, and so there's no issue there. Well, and you have a little one that comes around every once in a while, right? Your, your granddaughter, Nora, is, does she make her way into the office every once in a while? Oh, usually on the weekends, so that's not a problem. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, that, but that, I do love it when she comes in. And that, so you mentioned about good and bad from working from home. I mean, I've emailed you late on a weeknight uh, where it's you know ten, eleven o'clock on the on the East Coast, and you you've gotten back to me, and I said, well, what the heck is she doing? It's you know it's eight o'clock <laughs> Phoenix time, but like you said, you're you're working. Well, like you said earlier in, in, the, in the opening, it takes a lot of hard work. There's no such thing as easy when it, when it comes to business. and, and uh, it, it just takes a lot of hard work and focus to do a good job. Well, let's get to that now, the, the actual business, um, Michelle. You, you do it all. You're one-stop shopping. Again, I have a Word document. You, your company, you have editors you have interior formatters. You have cover designers. You you can do it all. Tell me about the you know the actual business part of your work and 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 all that goes into that. Well, I started out just working by myself from a home office, and my background is in design. But over time, people started asking, "Do you do uh, covers? Do you do interiors?" And I, I could answer yes to that question myself because that's how I was trained. But then they started asking, "Can you edit my manuscript? Can you make an ebook for me? Can you build a website for me?" And I got tired of saying no, so I just reached out to people and said, "Can you help me with this?" And they said yes. <laughs> And so it just sort of happened by accident and very gradually. And and it's very, it is very helpful for someone like me. And again, your your company's been so customer friendly in terms of as you called it, you know, hand holding. Because I had no idea, and and I don't know if our listeners out there like a book like mine. When you order it on Amazon, and here's a quick plug, you can find the principle surviving and thriving on Amazon and on my website. Since Michelle's company, 1106, Design 1106, uh, has uh, created that for me. Um, that's a print-on-demand. Michelle, will you explain to our, our listening audience, what, what does that mean? Oh, sure. I'll be happy to. Um, back in the day, authors had to work with a traditional publisher because only traditional publishers had the distribution channels to get a book into a bookstore. When Amazon came on the scene, they, they created a great upheaval in the publishing industry because Amazon made it possible for people to, for anyone to put a book up and sell a book on Amazon. And Amazon came around with, and they actually invented the print-on-demand model. And what that is, is that someone goes on Amazon, orders a book, the order is shipped over to a printing company who prints the, a single copy of the book and ships it to the buyer. So nowadays, nobody has to spend money to print 5,000 books and store them in the garage and hope they get sold. Now it's one d 
the, the book is not printed until the order comes in. So it has opened up great opportunities for independent authors because they can get into the publishing business for really a very low one-time upfront investment, and then they can take it as far as they're able to take it on their own without tying up their capital. Uh, so that was a revolution in the publishing industry. And it must have been great, really, for your business to, to have your business grow like that. And uh, you, you very smartly uh, added all these features to, to your company. Well, what it did, the, what, what Amazon and the print-on-demand model did was it exploded the opportunity, right? For, for designers like me, our only customers used to be a very small number of publishers. Now the customer base has just exploded. So many people are wanting to publish a book, and, and we can help them do it. And, and now there's far more book designers than there ever were, I'm sure. And, and we can serve them, and it's just great. Well, Michelle, we're up uh, against the break. We're going to pull up one of your songs here. We're going to be right back with today's guest, Michelle DiFilippo, the owner uh, of Design, not 1106, but 1106, out in Phoenix, Arizona. We will be right back with Michelle DiFilippo here on Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, and this is show number 16. We are talking books, we are talking design, and we are talking about the process of publishing uh, your own books with Michelle DiFilippo. She is the owner and a designer from 1106 Design. Uh, Michelle, I am learning so much uh, having worked with you and talking to you today. Um, I want to ask you, Michelle, about leading your company remotely. You know, you talked about that you have uh, 16 people, you have a, a, a partner, and they're all over the country. In terms of leadership and, and the initiatives that you want for your com company, the customer service, the way you want things done, how do you build a culture and display your leadership when it's you know when it is remote do you, do you bring the people together once a year do you do you have uh, team meetings uh, via Skype how do you, how do you do that actually we don't do meetings and i know that may sound uh, strange to someone who who spends their life in meetings but I used to have, as I said, a traditional typesetting company, and we had all of the face-to-face -face interaction that you're talking about. We would have meetings. We would have, um, if someone wasn't performing well, we had to handle that in person, which was often difficult for everybody. Working remotely, in my opinion, is actually easier because we can stay focused on the task at hand. The only thing that matters is whether that work is, is satisfactory or it's not. And I can give them instant feedback and say, okay, I needed this instead. Can you make that change? And they will. And they, they learn gradually what kind of standards we, we expect from, from them. Um, there, there's no distractions. There's no water cooler uh, arguments. There's no office politics. It's, it works very well, I think. And, Michelle, who, who gets the final say in, yes, that's, you know, I'm really happy with that? Is it is it just, is it the customer? Is it is it you? Like, did you look at my cover before I got it, or was it all you know what I wanted, and you just kind of monitored it from afar? Oh no, I look at everything before it goes to the client, and and I have to be satisfied before I'll allow it to be sent to the client. And then after that, as you know, you would weigh in and you would suggest changes that you wanted. And if you had, you didn't do this, but if you had suggested changes that I thought were a bad idea, I would push back and I would tell you, Andrew, that's not a great idea because blah, blah, blah. 
So it's a very collaborative process, uh, even though it is remote. It, it was. And, uh, you know, I always felt the need to, to call you, and, and you had a great balance of taking my calls from time to time versus using the platform. We used an online platform called Reich. And uh, like you had said many times, it's all right there. Uh, the work orders, the changes, and uh, you really, you know, produced a great product. And, and I did get a lot of positive feedback last weekend. So for that, I, I, I am grateful. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. So, Michelle, interestingly enough, you know, the world came from Brooklyn. Uh, I don't know if our listeners knew that, but uh, the world came from Brooklyn, and you are certainly part of that. And when we got chatting, I went to high school in Brooklyn, and you are from Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. How, did, how did you make your way out to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and, and what made you stay? Well, it was an accident, really. My, my new husband and I came to visit my grandparents, who had retired to Phoenix in 1975. Actually, they were in Scottsdale. And so we were young. We were in our 20s. We... We were thinking about moving to Long Island, but we didn't really want to do that because the commute would be so long to Manhattan to get to our jobs. So we came for a visit, and we were just blown away. We grew up in Brooklyn. We had never seen a city that was clean and new like Mm. like Scottsdale and Phoenix were at the time. We were amazed that you could drive to work instead of taking a subway. And I think that alone was enough to make us decide to, to move here. So, so that's what we did. And it was a culture shock, though. It took us some time to get used to the Southwest and to, to live a slower-paced life than what we were used to in, in Brooklyn. Um, so now Phoenix is a big city. It's, it's picked up speed a little bit, but it's still clean and it's still more laid back than New York. I'm always amazed when I go back to uh, New York for a visit and, at how fast everything moves. So <laughs> yeah. We're still a little bit slower here, Yeah, which, which is nice. What was the biggest thing you did miss about uh, New York? I still miss good food. I'm still looking for a good pizza and a good bagel. <laughs> I think I asked you that question when I interviewed you. Once you said the pizza, I think you made me sign the deal with that answer. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah, they just can't. They just can't capture pizza in Phoenix. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Michelle, I work with a fantastic uh, English department in my school. They are. Uh, such a great group of professionals, uh, uh, literary people, and and really teachers. They're they're a magnificent group. You know what what are some of the books that have had a great impact on your your life? I mean, you are in the book business. What are you know some books, two or three books that have really impacted your life and personally or professionally? Well, personally, um, a book I read when I was just a teenager, I guess, The Agony and the Ecstasy, which was the story of Michelangelo. I think that's the book that made me fall in love with art at a very young age. And, and I still reread that book sometimes, and it's the only book I ever reread because I keep discovering new things in that story. Um, profession- for entertainment, I like to read horror just because the creativity of of how Stephen King and Dean Koontz create characters, such twisted people, it always makes me smile. And professionally, I guess, the book that encapsulates what a designer does would be the Complete Manual of Typography. It's the best explanation around what designers do and, and the things we think about when we design a book, both the cover and the interior. It's also a great remedy for insomnia. So unless you're a really detailed person, I don't recommend you go out and buy it. Okay. Okay. Well, your designers and you guys, again, uh, the book, uh, uh, the principal, I was so happy with it. Michelle, in designing that cover, we went back and forth through a a few different, uh, um, um, what's the word I'm thinking of, Uh, you know, uh, types of of covers. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted a personal touch. Do you see that with authors in terms of that they want to use a real uh, picture of something or a real person? You know, the book is me facing away. The cover is me facing away in the hallway because I wanted to to give the feeling of, you know, supervision. I get the kids, you know. Do you do you push people in that way? Do you or do you do most people just take kind of the options that you give them uh, with that? Well, the personal, uh, in your case, the p- having your own picture on the cover makes perfect sense because you're putting yourself out there as a consultant and an educator, and it makes sense for your picture to be on the cover. 
in most cases, though, it's really not a good idea to put a photo on a cover, and this is the way I counsel my clients, because a photo, by its very nature, whoever you show on the cover will exclude everyone else. Mm-hmm. And we, will, we always want the buyer to see themselves in the cover, right? And people are different. They're, they're short, they're tall, they're fat, they're thin, they're black, they're white. You can't show everybody on the cover. Sure. And, and so in most cases, it's better to not put people on the cover. Another reason is that the model that you choose for the cover may elicit a negative reaction from the potential buyer. Maybe the person on the cover looks just like their ex-husband. And so they will never buy the book. We don't want that kind of a reaction to happen, even accidentally. So in most cases, we choose images of of things and or just an all type cover. Uh, It just works better and it's safer for the indie publisher. And that's what big publishers do if you look at the bestsellers. And that's interesting. I would I would have never thought about that. Um, That's very interesting. Michelle, how about, you know, I tried not to, oh, that was the question I wanted to ask you. I gave you kind of a concept, and you guys helped me with it. Do most people just come to you and say, okay, you show me some things, or do do they say, I kind of want this, I'm thinking of a beach? Or, do they give you a guide, or do most people just say, show me what you got? Well, it's about 50-50. Some people come to us with very specific ideas about what they want on their cover. And I'll have a conversation with them as to whether or not that's appropriate for the kind of book that they're writing. Um, We will also come up with cover ideas on our own and show the client. And again, it's back to that collaborative process. When we come up with a cover, we don't just pull any idea out of our head, we look to the best sellers to see what's being done now, what the big publishers are doing, because big big publishers do a massive amount of research when they start a cover design. They don't do anything accidentally or on a whim. So we can piggyback on that research without having to pay for it. If we go look and see what they're doing, we can position our clients' books to compete well with those best sellers. That falls into what we talked about with the opening concept of uh, creativity and ideas. You know, meet someone who's done it before, and uh, you're getting a visual by looking at some of those bestsellers, so that's great. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I I had asked you multiple times, uh, uh, you know, I didn't want to be a pain in the ass customer. I I didn't want to, you know, be be bothering you, and, and you assured me I wasn't. No. How do you? Where is that? Where is the line of okay? Enough's enough. We've made you know twelve changes. You haven't been happy. You know here it is. You know go enjoy your book. Like where's the? Where do you draw the line? When's enough? And when's enough enough? Well, we have we have two goals at the beginning of, of every job to provide great design and to make our clients happy. We never forget that we're serving you, right? It's your book. It's not our book. We offer our best advice which you can accept or you can reject. So that's our, those are our first two goals. Now, sometimes clients have their own idea about what, what the design of the book should look like. And I, like I said, I counsel them, and I explain the downside if I think they're doing something wrong. But ultimately, uh, it is their book, and I do want them to be happy. I don't want them to go off and say that 1106 design wouldn't do what I wanted. Uh, because they are hiring us to do what they want, uh, hopefully with our counsel. Well, you provided both, and uh, you had a happy customer here, and here we are on the radio talking about books. So, <laughs> Michelle, we uh, we do have to take another break. We're going to be back with our write-in portion of the show, and uh, fans and friends can email in any questions they have for the write-in portion of the show, andrew at com. Andrew at NeverSyncMediaGroup.com. And you can also uh, hit me up on Twitter, at Andrew Murata 21 This is Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving, with my friend and the owner of 1106 Design, Michelle D. Filippo. We will be right back. Well, life on the farm is kind of laid back. Ain't much an old country boy like me can't hack. So early to rise, early in a sack. I thank God I'm a country boy. Well, a simple kind of life never did me no harm. Raising me a family and working on the farm. Days are all filled with an easy country charm. This ain't no 
rag, it's a flag, and we don't wear it on our heads. It's a symbol of the land where the good guys live. Are you listening to what I said? You a coward and a fool, and you broke all the rules, and you wounded our American pride. And now we're coming with a gun. And welcome back, everyone. Good morning. This is Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. We are on Country 107.7 WDLC, 106.9 WYNY, and Wall Radio. And this is the portion of the show where fans and friends can write in uh, either to myself or to my guests, and they can ask a question. So, And you can email in the show, andrew at com. Or shoot those questions on Twitter, at Andrew Murata 21 uh, We talked this uh, week about ideas and creativity. And a quick recap, if you're looking for inspiration, you're looking to, to find ways to channel that energy and get some ideas, number one, have a brainstorming session. Get a big sheet of paper, scratch it all up, write it all up, draw it all up, and, and put some ideas on paper with no hurdles. Just put things and thoughts in your head onto that paper. Number two, exercise. And exercise with an open mind, thinking about what the topic is that you're tuned into. What is it that you're trying to trying to get to? Kind of have an open mind. And when you're exercising, those, those thoughts, they'll flow into your head. Number three, listen to podcasts, get on Twitter, get on social media, and put the question out there. Does anybody have any ideas about blank and whatever it is and you will get some answers for sure meet someone who uh, has done it before get yourself around an expert get in touch with with someone who knows who's done it before and most times they're going to help you and lastly have that mindset of not yet you don't have the answers yet you don't have uh the the solution yet we're going to welcome back in our guest, Michelle DiFilippo, my paisan from Brooklyn. She is the owner of 1106 Design. And, Michelle, we did get uh, two questions in uh, this morning for you. And the first is, Michelle, in terms of education, what's the best advice that you could give to kids uh, and teachers to, to get kids uh, to read early and often? Oh, I think the best way to start is to read to children, even when they're babies, so that they discover early on that books are an important part of life and that there's all kinds of things to be discovered in books. I remember uh, favorite books from when I was a kid. The, the, the Five Little Peppers was one title I remember. Uh, it was just a journey of discovery, and, and it's the most important thing we can do for kids, I think. I agree with you, and sometimes at night I'm, I'm so tired, I'm doing all these different things, and my daughter will come down and say, Daddy, can you read? And I've learned i got to drop everything because that's precious time. So that's great advice, uh, Michelle. The second question uh, that we had emailed in the show here, and again, you can email in a question, andrew at com. Uh, Michelle, what is, what's the biggest mistake a new author can make? You, you've met all kinds. You've met all, all different people from all walks of life. What's the biggest mistake an author can make? Well, in my opinion, the biggest mistake an author makes is, and it's not entirely they, their fault, they will go online and they will type in self-publishing. And the companies that come up, up first when authors look for self-publishing are the companies that really do not serve them well. They're companies that uh, produce a really bad book, market to them on a bait-and-switch basis. They think it's cheap to work with these companies, but they find out after they're in that it's very expensive indeed. So uh, th- that's a mistake. They, they, they look for a price they can afford, which is usually a commendable thing, but they don't know enough about the business to understand that they're getting what they pay for. They're not getting the book that the market needs. Uh, creating a book takes a lot of time and effort and and skill, and buyers know the difference. So if you go out there with an amateurish-looking book, buyers are going to post bad reviews, and that puts a quick end to your publishing dreams. So the most important thing that an author can do is create the very best book possible, and that's what buyers will respond to. You told me those exact same things uh, when we got started, and and. You said, Andrew, we're going to make you a, a great book, and, and you did. You, you held your word there, and I'm so glad uh, 
that we did contract with you. Michelle, how could any of our listeners, if they, they do want to get in touch with you, again, the company is 1106 Design. You could find you online. But if they wanted to either email you or get you on, on Twitter, uh, what would be the best way for our fans and listeners to get in touch with you if they had questions or, or might want to get a book to you to, for, for design? Oh, sure. Uh, you can email me. My email address is md Michael David at 1106design.com. That's the best way to get me. I don't have time to look at Twitter too often or Facebook too often. That's second in priority for me. Uh, if you go to my website, 1106design.com, you can download a free copy of my book. It's called Publish Like the Pros, and it contains all the advice I give every client who talks to me for the first time. And you can read it in, at your leisure and contact me for a free consultation anytime. Fantastic, Michelle. You did a great job today. So happy to have you on. And uh, next time you you, you come east, uh, make sure you contact me. Uh, a slice of pizza on me. We got some good <laughs> pizza up here uh, outside New York City, uh, up in Milford, PA, and, and Port Jervis, PA, some of my, my favorite pizzerias. So uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, this was Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. We are going to end uh, with our quote. Uh, and just before the quote, next week's guest is also a good friend of mine, Dr. D, uh, Dina Stevenson. Met Dr. Dina through school this year, and uh, she's an educational consultant and the owner of Dr. Doc Dina Enterprises. Uh, Dr. Dina does a wealth of educational things. She's also a medical doctor. Uh, she, she's fantastic. Uh, so she will be next week's guest when we will be talking education and beyond. Our quote to end the show, uh, we met a very creative person today, Michelle DiFilippo. Here's our quote. Your mind is like a parachute. It only works if it is open. So open your mind to bigger and better things. And that is all for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Come out to the Fall Foliage Festival tomorrow in Port Jervis. I will be there signing books. Uh, the principal being released uh, again, Port Jervis style, this weekend. That is all, everyone. Go out and change the world for the better. Took a walk and passed your house late last night. All the shades were cold and drawn. Way down tight from within the dim light cast. Two silhouettes on the shade. Oh, what a lovely couple they made. Put his arms around your waist.